Have you ever heard the sound of freedom? Freedom, 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 Have you ever heard the sound of freedom? freedom? You are listening to The Flip Side with Noah Filippiak, connecting the reality of the gospel to the grit of life. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash noahfilippiak or at noahfilippiak.com slash give. What up, everybody? Welcome to episode 29 of the Flipside Podcast. Welcome back. It is good to be back. Your second podcast in quarantine. Kind of your third. My one about the quarantine was was just, that was two episodes ago, episode 27. It was just as the quarantine was starting. I, I, I didn't know what we were in for. I, I mean, I knew a little bit it was starting to get real, but it wasn't real, real yet. So today's date is April the 27th. We've been quarantining for quite a while, a uh, month and a half. Shelter in place. Everything's closed. How you doing? How you doing? I'm not doing so good. I'm not doing so good. I'll be super glad when the quarantine <laughs> is over and life will be back to normal. Hopefully there'll be a day years from now that someone stumbles upon this podcast and says, oh yeah, I remember that way back then, back in history. Now life is back to normal again. Sort of like if you had surgery. I've had three ACL surgeries and they're they're bad. They're rough. You're laying there, you can't move your leg, you're in tons of pain, you're bedridden for about a week. And you know, it's terrible. And you just think, I want to get to that place where I can look back and say, "Oh yeah, I, I remember when I had that surgery. I got a little scar there, but I'm up. I'm walking around. I'm doing my thing again." You know, I might have a little a little limp, a little tendonitis. Okay, maybe it's a bad analogy. Maybe the analogy's falling apart. But to be able to look back, someday we will get there. We will get back to normal life. You'll be able to go to uh, movies and restaurants and hang out with your friends and go to church and have human interaction in community. And that will that will happen again someday. So in all seriousness, I hope I hope this this season has brought you into a, a rich season of prayer. I know I've been I've been praying obviously, I mean for myself and my own my own issues, my anxiety, depression flaring up and just needing to lean into Jesus to be my strength. It's sort of like when you're fasting from food. You're you're fasting from food, you don't have the food you you normally would eat would eat. Food is a comfort, you also need it. And the, the reason you fast when you choose to fast is so then you you lean into Jesus when those hunger pangs come. When, when you want that comfort or when you want that sustenance that you need, you, you go to Jesus, obviously for a short period of time. And that's kind of what the quarantine has been for me. I mean, there's, there's a level of anxiety and depression that comes with it. There's a there's a level of, of disconnect. There's a level of man, I can't I can't do this on my own. And so I've been reaching out to people for help, uh, starting up some counseling again, reaching out to close friends, my accountability team. And I hope you're doing the same thing. Don't don't act like you have to do it alone, because you don't. Uh, it's 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 a time to lean into Jesus. It's a time to lean into counselors. It's a time to lean into mentors and uh, accountability people to keep you strong during this time when frankly you're just not strong and so that's what that's a bit of what my quarantine experience has been like and i'll be thankful when it's done just like if you fasted from something uh, during lent that you really really like and then easter finally come and it's like yeah that's right that's right baby we're gonna we're gonna eat a whole bunch of that thing right now (laughs) whatever you fasted from I did that from dessert one year, and I just remember Easter coming, and it was, all right, it's time for some dessert. It's going to be a party once quarantine's over, and, and hopefully we do have a new sense of appreciation with my ACL surgeries. I think I have a bit of a sense of appreciation for being able to use my legs and to not take it for granted, and that knowing that there's people who can't use their legs, and, and there's certainly lots of things to be sad about in life, but we don't. We don't take time to be grateful for the things that we are given. Have you taken time lately to be grateful that your legs work? Probably not. You probably don't even think about it or that your lungs work and you're breathing air right now. And there's plenty of people 
whose lungs don't work or whose legs don't work that would say, yeah, I'd like that. I'd love your life. I would love those lungs or those legs. All that just is an analogy and a metaphor for when quarantine is over, shelter in place is over, coronavirus has been contained, so to speak, that hopefully we have a new sense of appreciation for what we do have, a new sense of man, I'm not going to take this for granted. I'm not going to take people for granted. I'm not going to take community for granted. Maybe I'm going to watch a little bit less TV, a little bit less screen time because I've I've had more than my fill of that and I'm going to enjoy uh, what I've been given. So who knows? Who knows what will come up with it? But f- seriously, hopefully, hopefully it'll be over soon. This is episode three of the quarantine edition of the Flipside Podcast. Hopefully there will not be 12 episodes of the quarantine edition of the Flipside podcast. So we'll keep moving on here. I know in my last episode, 28, with Brooks Hall, check that out. If you missed it, it was an awesome interview. But I mentioned that I was going to have a little Patreon swag ready to go for you in this episode. And you know what? I, I, I don't. I don't. It's I'm sorry. I feel like the father who told his children they would get ice cream after church, and then he just drove home and was like, no, you're not you're not getting ice cream. No, it's it's not that cut and dry. It It's, it's almost here. It's almost here. It, it's just that it takes a lot of work. I have my administrative assistant working triple time right now uh, to get the the swag done. I'm paying him uh, triple time as well. Um, The administrative assistant is me. I'm also the executive producer. And so (laughs) I know where my gifts lie. And I can tell you right now, they do not lie in looking for shopping, print-on-demand websites, and uh, a good friend... Shout out to Zane Ogle, WilfordMina.com. Check out Zane if you have any design and graphic needs. Zane has been doing design work for me for many, many years. Went to my church back in Lansing. Then he moved to Hawaii. Then he moved to Alaska. Not kidding. Pretty awesome. How many people do you know that have lived in Hawaii and Alaska? For real, live there. Not vacation there. Live there for years on end. That's Zane, my man. He's an awesome guy. He's always done design work. He does a pay what you can scale uh, for nonprofits. And so I appreciate Zane a lot. Zane's been doing an awesome job on the designs. And now it's they're done and it's super exciting. And it's I've been sh- shopping for shopping websites, if that makes sense. Print on demand websites and then but then all that mechanical stuff of of then, okay, I gotta order that, put this in and then put the design in. But it's almost there. I'm just telling you, it is almost there. And it's exciting. I saw one of the proofs of a mug, and we have this design of a hippo holding up a sign that says, I'm a flipoponymous. It's incredible. And then it says the Flipside Podcast under it. So there's there's two designs that are goofy. That's I'm just that's a tease. That's a tease for you. I'm not gonna tell you all of them until they're ready. There's two designs that are goofy. That's that's one of them. And then there's two designs that are serious. And so you get to choose. You know, when you sign up for a be a Patreon supporter, you choose the thing you want. Uh, there's mugs and journals and and water bottles and cool stuff, buttons. You choose the thing you want depending on the level of your support, but then you also choose what design you want. So I'm not going to stick you with one of the goofy ones if you just want something serious. I'm not going to stick you with the serious one if you want something goofy, but it just looks cool. It looks sweet. Zane's done a really nice job, and that should be ready next episode. I can tell you that every episode. It should be ready next episode. I'll just do that for the next 100 episodes. It, It will be great. We can keep talking about it over and over. So a couple shout outs. Shout out to my six-year-old who won't sleep in her bed and keeps coming into our room and waking us up. Shout out. Shout out to my blue light glasses. That's right. Rocking them right now. Got the black rims on. Uh, I'm on Zoom all the time during the quarantine for my job on meetings and Zoom like sucks the soul out of your brain if you use Zoom a lot like in a job like mine when you're on these video call meetings so I got these blue light glasses and they're supposed to they're supposed to help you not get headaches from looking at computer screens and your phone all day so on my social media I was uh, oh my they came with two as a two pack so, wow what a deal right it was a clear pair and a black rim pair and both honestly are way trendier than me I, I am 
I'm not, my wife would like me to be trendier than I am. I'm not super trendy, never really have been. I always wore free t-shirts and blue jeans and sneakers in high school <laughs> prior to meeting my wife. She's, she's done a little bit of work on me, and, uh, but it's still a long way to go. So these glasses are pretty trendy looking and, and I thought it would be funny. Uh, do I wear the black rim pair or the clear rim pair? So I put them on uh, a poll, a survey on social media, and it was pretty funny. You can check that out if you wanna if you wanna chime in after the fact, I guess. So everybody just gave all their opinions, and it's it it was pretty hilarious because well, it's not really after the fact. You could jump in. I don't. I'm still. Let's say the jury's still out. The jury is still out. So today I posted a picture of me wearing both pairs, the black and the clear, saying, "Hey, the results are in. Your your this is what's your vote." Uh, it was very helpful, and now I'm wearing both pair because, you know, there was a strong black rim uh, party and a strong clear rimmed party. It was much like American politics, very divided down the middle, very divisive. Everybody uh, throwing stones and grenades and shouting at each other about which view uh, was correct. So, so shout out to the blue rim glasses that you can't see someday. You you will see poten- potential. I'm gonna say another should. I'm. <laughs> If you if you follow the podcast for a long time, you know that I'm always talking about someday we'll have swag on the Patreon. Someday I will uh, do a live stream of the podcast and we'll do it video as well. And someday we'll have commercials that I make as well. Someday all those things are going to happen someday. Just keep keep hope alive, baby. Keep hope alive. So someday when when I have a video live stream of the podcast, you will get to see the blue light glasses that you cannot see right now. Shout out to the flip side mailbag. Mailbag's been a little bit lonely. Haven't heard the mailbag drop in a while. Mailbag needs a little love. A little love to the mailbag. So you can email the mailbag. It works like this. You go to your email. I know emails for people in their 50s and older. But kids, you can do it. Go to gmail.com, sign up, put your name in there, get a username and password, and then you can compose an email. I know it's it's similar to a homing pigeon that they used back in the 1800s, but you can write an email. You type in this, podcast at beyondthebattle.net, podcast at beyondthebattle.net. Send me an email. Tell me uh, what color blue light glasses I should wear. Ask a question, something you want me to talk about on the podcast. Tell me you're offended. Tell me you're angry. Whatever, whatever you want to tell me. I like to read your emails on the podcast and interact with them. Podcast at beyondthebattle.net. Last shout out before we get into our topic of the day. Topic of the day is, by the way, which you may have saw in the title, why do bad things happen to good people? So I'll talk about that in a second. Unrelated to that, we got a puppy two or three weeks ago, quarantine therapy. Yeah, we've been petless for a while. Big big pet family. We love pets. We've had dogs and cats. No shame here. I'm a cat person. Grew up with cats. Love cats. My wife discovered midway through our marriage. Uh, I mean, our marriage is still going, but you know, midway through the 15 years of our marriage we've had so far that she is allergic to the cats that we owned. And so she said, these will be our last cats. Very sad. Very sad for Noah. Uh, three, four months ago, our, our last cat died. It was very sad. Percy. Yeah. I have no shame in that. My manhood is very secure. Love cats. So no more cats. And so we've had dogs before as well. And so we got a puppy. My wife is the dog person. So the kind of the, the good thing about that is when the dog does anything naughty, which it's doing more and more, uh, it's her fault because she's the one that wanted the dog and she's the one that picked out a puppy. So we have a very cute puppy. Pictures of puppy on social media. Speaking of polls that didn't help, we did a vote for the name of the poll and picked a different name. Anyway, so Shout out to the puppy. It was a lot of fun to have a puppy until my wife found a puppy training book. No longer fun to have a puppy. <laughs> so, yes, a puppy training book basically is like prison for the dog and the owner. You're not allowed to touch the dog. You're not allowed to look at the dog. You're not allowed to play with the dog. You basically, <laughs> unless unless it, don't ask me. I'm an eight on the Enneagram. I'm an ENFP. I don't, if those things mean anything to you, I, I don't care about rules. I don't care about those things. I just want to have the dog 
and let's have fun with the dog. Let's play with the dog, which is what we did for the first week of owning the dog before the puppy book came in. So pray for me. Pray for my family. Pray for my heart that I would be more receptive of having the puppy training book. All right, so we're talking about why do bad things happen to good people today? Um, that question, I phrase it like that only because I've I've heard of that before. I think it's the name of a book. I've heard sermons, I think, growing up, and I thought, that's a great question. And it is really something that we wrestle with. I think that COVID-19, coronavirus, everything that's happening, it's a question that's that's arisen. Why do bad things happen to good people? There's questions that go along with that. If God is all good, how could bad things happen? If God is all loving, how could how could bad things happen? And, and if you, depending on your theology, depending on how, um, uh, so this is just an intro to the topic. I'm actually going to be switching over to a teaching that I did that's, that's going to hit on a lot of this. And I'd love, again, I'd love for you to interact. If there's more you want to talk about, let me know and we can talk about it in the next episode. But I don't remember, honestly, if I mentioned this in the teaching or not, but if your if your theology of God is one where God always hooks you up, where God always gives you the good things because he loves you, then, then whenever anything bad happens in your life, whenever anything bad happens, your your only res, your only options now are if you you it's multiple choice. If something bad happens, multiple choice is either God is weak, so this thing was more powerful than him, and so this thing happened. That's option A, God is weak, or God is unloving. He doesn't love me. He's Maybe maybe God even is evil, like God is inflicting this because he's an evil God. Maybe God is even sinful. So that's option B or maybe option C. And then option uh, maybe D would be, you know, I'm a bad Christian. I don't have enough faith. And I was told if I had just had enough faith, this thing would be healed. Or be, because I'm a bad Christian, I, and so therefore, I need to do more. And I'm filled with condemnation. And I'm filled with, oh, I, I'm not good enough. I need to do more, be more. And I get on the treadmill of legalism, and I try to conjure up enough faith. I'm just going to, I'm really going to believe this. I'm really going to do better and try harder. I'm going to earn God's approval. I'm going to earn his favor. I'm going to earn my salvation through my works. And... That never leads anywhere good. It is, it's a total life of complete slavery, and it's actually the opposite of the gospel. So we're going to get into that today. I'm going to switch over to a teaching that I did back in March. So this is the first teaching, if you're a podcast follower, that I've shared from my, my new position uh, at Ada Bible Church. So I work with the young adult ministry. It's a huge church, massive church. Uh, 10,000 people or something like that. The young adult ministry is 18 to 35-year-olds. We have about 200 or so on a Tuesday night. So really, it's like a small church in and of itself. I'm not the primary teacher. That's not my role right now for this season of my life. But I teach maybe every month and a half, something like that. And so we were doing a series on evil and it was called All Kinds of Evil. And so the week that I got assigned was When the Good Guys Lose. That's so you'll hear me reference When the Good Guys Lose. And essentially it's asking this question of when bad things happen to good people. Coincidentally, it was in March, when mid early to mid-March, when this teaching was given. It was the last young adult ministry we had. We call it Union. It was the last union we had prior to the shutdown. So it was not meant to be a coronavirus teaching, but it ended up being that way. Also, one more thing before I throw you into the teaching, the format for Union is a little bit different. So instead of a one sermon without any interruption, there are two interruptions, and those two interruptions are time for table discussion. So we break, it's sort of a cafe style setup, people sitting at tables together, and we break twice we give discussion questions, and they uh, answer, talk about, I should say, discuss those questions at the table for six minutes, and then come back to the teaching. So in the recording, I've cut out that time so that you're not sitting there twiddling your thumbs, going like this for six minutes uh, while you listen to this podcast. But I would encourage you to reflect on those questions that I ask at those times. And 
if you are wondering, well, he's going to a recording. Does that mean that the episode's going to be over? Is there going to be a Noah's rant? I don't know what I'm going to do without a Noah's rant. It's quarantine. Uh, and with, it's quarantine, and after all, and, and I need Noah's rant to get me through it. I, I got you. I feel you. I got you. I'm here for you. The Flipside Podcast is here for you. So there will be a Noah's rant. So, so stay tuned. If you're into that sort of thing, okay, if you're one of those types of people, we've got Noah's rant for you. So let's jump in to a teaching on why do bad things happen to good people slash when the good guys lose. Well, uh, my name is Noah. I'm one of the pastors here at Union. And I get to just open the word with you tonight. As Brad said, we're going to do some Bible teaching. We're also going to give you more chance at your table to talk and get to know each other and talk through the teaching uh, while we go through the teaching. So we've been doing a series called All Kinds of Evil. And tonight we're looking at the question, the kind of evil where the good guys lose. We're using good guys in the, the movie sense of the word, the good guys and the bad guys. I think there's something innate in all of us, that wants the good guys to win, right? I don't know about you, but I won't go to a movie where the good guys lose. I I have enough sadness and depression in my regular world that I don't need to pay $12 to go to a movie theater to leave sad and depressed. Does anyone else feel that way? I know some of you really artsy people are like, no, give me the sad, depressing movies. No, I'm good. I'm good. Like 12 bucks is way too much for a movie anyway. I want to be happy. I want the good guys to win. That's what I want to see in a movie. And really, I think most movies are that way. I think the Hollywood has figured that out. There's something in us that wants to see the good guys win. So think about the movie series Star Wars. Now, when I talk about Star Wars, thank you, I'm talking about the original Star Wars, okay? Episodes four, five, and six. Please tell me, for the sake of all that is pure and holy, that you still watch Star Wars. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I see that hand. I see the spirit moving. If you haven't, uh, we need a text-in number so that we make sure everyone can be educated on the original Star Wars movies. Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Darth Vader. That is Boba Fett in the corner, not Mando. Okay, Just, just to make that clear. Okay, that is Boba Fett, like the coolest Star Wars character of all time. All right, so Star Wars is probably the most successful movie franchise ever, and it continues to be. Every movie they make just sells a billion dollars worth of tickets, even if the new ones aren't as good as the old ones. But, okay, Uh, why is Star Wars so popular? It's because the good guys win. That's why Star Wars is so popular. Can you imagine Star Wars if, you know, Luke Skywalker goes to fight Darth Vader, and Darth Vader just hacks Luke Skywalker in half the first time they meet. Uh, Darth Vader, the Emperor, they, they enslave the whole galaxy. Everybody's a slave now. And in the end, they roll credits, and the movie's over, and you go home. Would anybody want to see that version of Star Wars? Uh, would you go re-see that movie and, and tell all your friends about it? No, you wouldn't. Because you want the good guys to win right? And that's why Star Wars is such a compelling movie. So what we do is we apply this to our faith. It is innate in us. We want the good guys to win, and we attach God to this idea, and we think and believe that if you're good, good things will happen to you. You'll win. If you're good, you'll win. Uh, God will make good things happen to you if you're good. And if you're bad, Uh, Bad things will happen. God will make bad things happen to you. So for our intro, we often do stories here at Union. I want to tell you a story about a couple uh, that is outside of Union. It's Michael and Lisa Gunger, and you might be familiar with the band Gunger, or I always called it Gungor because that's how it looks, but it's not. I learned it's Gunger. Okay, it's Gunger, so I'm saying it right now. Uh, They had a very popular uh, worship band that had an album called Beautiful Things out in 
2010. And the song Beautiful Things was, is a song I have sung many times in worship, just at the top of my lungs, a very passionate song about how God has taken broken things. Some of what we're talking about, there's brokenness in this world, and, and he takes brokenness and makes beautiful things out of that brokenness. And, and we're broken, and he makes beautiful things out of us. Well, Michael and Lisa Gunger, today... Uh, Michael is an atheist. Uh, he pu- publicly is an atheist. And, and his wife, Lisa, she no longer believes that, that Jesus saves. She no longer would believe that, that salvation is found through Jesus. Uh, it, it's hard to kind of tell what she believes, but it would be that God exists, but it's sort of an, an anything goes uh, sort of idea of God, and, and certainly not that salvation is found through Jesus. And so what I want us to begin to think about, and I'm going to give you a chance here in a few minutes at your table to talk about this, is how does someone go from, from being uh, nationally known uh, worship leader, band, putting out these albums that we're singing regularly at Ada Bible Church and at Union uh, on a regular basis to becoming an atheist and someone that, that no longer believes uh, in the salvation of Jesus. And so what I'm going to do is, is play a, about a one-minute clip of the song, Beautiful Things, of, of Michael and Lisa uh, singing uh, the this, this song. And some of you may have never heard it, so it'll give you a little context. And for others of you, I wanted to jog your memory. And as you jog your memory, I want you to look at how, how passionate Michael sings out to God about how God makes beautiful things out of us and, and how intimate um, Lisa communes with Jesus as she sings these songs. And and then we're going to talk about what happened from 2010 when this video was shot uh, to today. So about a minute here of Beautiful Things by Gunger. So the, the first time I watched that, the video while I was prepping this, this teaching and prepping this presentation, I cried while I was watching that. And, and, and I cried because I just see their passion for Jesus in this video. And it just exudes from them in, in the way they led thousands, I mean tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people into communing with Jesus and how he makes beautiful things out of us. And and now, not in a condemning way or a judgmental way towards them, but just my sadness that that they now don't believe even that God exists. Or in Lisa's case, that, that, that Jesus is who she's singing about in this video. Uh, what I'm gonna play next is a, is a two-minute clip and then we're going to have you break and, and chat about it at your tables. A two-minute clip of an interview with Lisa, and it's, it's, I think it was 2018, so it's where she's at in her faith today. And she talks about how she got from 2010, this, this video and these words, to where she is today as no longer believing in Jesus and, and where her husband Michael is today as, and being an atheist. There's a phrase she uses several times. She talks about a transactional idea of God. I want you to key in on that phrase, transactional idea of God, as she talks about it and begin to think about uh, what that means for, for me to have an idea of God that I will do good things for God, and then God will 
make good things happen back to me. A transactional idea of God. About two minutes, and then we'll break at your tables. Start dating this boy who's like super Christian. We get married really young. We're too young to even rent a car when we're married. We didn't drink or cuss. So we end up getting a job at a really big church in Michigan. And this church was the size of a mall. I mean, it's huge. There's about 10,000 people. We built a house out in the country. They paid for our car, for our gas. They paid for Michael's school. We were 20 years old and we had this, this dream job. We didn't have sex with each other before we were married. We waited to kiss. We did it all right. We had this transactional idea of God and that's why we landed this really great, awesome job. We started trying to get pregnant and we couldn't get pregnant. And people would tell me, but just pray and believe, like, just say it and it will happen. And I thought, I just don't know how that can be true. We were traveling the world, we were going overseas and playing to sometimes 60,000 people in arenas. The more we ran into other people's stories, the more we started doubting what we'd been given. And Michael and I took this trip in Europe from Rome. We took trains up to Krakow. We visited the concentration camps. We walked through the crematoriums. And it's real hard to come back to America and pray for something when you have these images of people's hair in piles and children's shoes in piles. Your ideas on what a good God is can change pretty dramatically. So I came back and, and found myself trying to pray for us to have a baby or pray for our church or pray for these different things. And I just kept thinking about the concentration camp and how my whole perspective on my faith has been a transaction. If I'm good enough or if I pray enough, if I believe enough, then I get blessings and I get a baby or a good life. It's not how life is. Um, one more thing about their story. You, you, meant, you might have heard them say they worked at a 10,000-person church in Grand Rapids. Um, so it makes it even more. Or in Michigan, it was in Grand Rapids. Uh, it was at Res Life Church just across town. Uh, Michael was worship pastor, and, and Michael and Lisa were worship leaders. And it just, it just makes it more real. It makes me feel like they're in the room with us right now uh, as we sit here uh, for, for union and talk through these questions. And so we're going to give you a couple minutes, I think five or six minutes at your table, to talk about these two questions. The first one, um, in what ways have you bought in to the transactional idea of God and where has it led? This idea Lisa talked about. If I do good things for God, I've done these things. God, I've done it your way. Now, now God... Um, now it's your turn. Now do your end of the deal and make these good things happen for me. The second question, uh, what would you say or ask uh, to Lisa or Michael if you were having coffee with them? So uh, feel free to be super honest with this. You, um, w however you take that question, what would you say or what would you ask Lisa or Michael if you were having coffee with them, um, just you and them? Talk about that at your table, so then we'll come back. All right, if you can turn your eyes back this way. I hope you're having a great conversation at your table. Here in a few more minutes, I'll give you another chance to talk further at your table. So as we're, we're talking about the kind of evil where, where the good guys lose. And I, I think often what happens is we have this expectation that this world is heaven. That what we're living in right now is heaven. And we end up holding God to promises that he never made. So God made us a lot of promises. We can hold God to those promises. But there's promises that God never made. And we try holding God to those promises. And, and we're going to see what happens uh, when we do that. Uh, this world is not heaven. The Bible talks about what heaven will be like more accurately, the new earth when, when, when heaven comes down to earth and, and, and Jesus renews this earth uh, for all of eternity that we're going to spend with him. Uh, up on the screen, I have Revelation 21, 1 through 5. And I just want to key in on those verses in yellow, uh, verse 4. This is the second to last chapter of the Bible. So this is telling you how it ends. This is what we look forward to. It says there's going to be a day where there's <clears throat> there will be no more death. 
or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Guys, there's, there's coming a day where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So right there, it tells you there's an old order. There's going to be a new order. And, and you know what we're living in right now? The old order. <laughs> we are currently living in the old order where there is death. There is mourning, there is crying, there is pain. And, and, and I think what happens is we swap these orders around. If, if earth, it, where we're living in now, the current reality we're in is, is the floor, and it's where these bad things happen, it's, it's everyday life, um, we, we can get up to a, a spot up like this, and, and this is just an empty coffee mug. If I were to take this empty coffee mug, and if I were to believe that and lived like this, that, that this world is heaven, right? And I'm living in a world where there's no more death and there's no more morgue and crying and pain. God owes this to me because I'm good. God owes me the good things because I'm good. I'm, I'm holding God to promises he, he never kept. W- what happens when, when what I've built, my expectation, meets reality? I'm not actually going to shatter the glass in front of you. I know you're excited about it. And these guys were like, oh no, we sat in the front row. No, I just have a picture of it. <laughs> You're welcome. I got you, Max. All right, this is what would happen, right? If you dropped a glass from a high position, it, it, would, it, would, it would hit the, gr- the, the ground and it, and it would shatter. And so when you run into things, if, if you're living with the expectation that there's not going to be bad things that happen in your life because you follow Jesus, when you run into things like the Holocaust, the glass shatters. When you run into infertility, when you're trying to get pregnant, when you run into cancer, and God isn't answering your prayer for the cancer to be healed, and you run into tornadoes that kill dozens of people and and destroy everything in their path, and the good guys lose, and we have this expectation that this world is heaven, our faith shatters. I think many of us have been there. This also alludes to, though, why the movie Star Wars is so popular why we are drawn to the good guys winning, why we want to see good win out in the end, because we know it wasn't meant to be this way. That when God created the world in Genesis 1 and 2, he created it good, he created it without sin, and therefore none of these things existed. When there was no sin in the world, there was no holocaust, there was no death at all, there was no mourning, crying, or pain. And we also know because Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and gave us the final victory. He made Revelation 21 possible. We're going to talk a bit more about what that looks like to look forward to the Revelation 21 hope that we have in Jesus, the victory that he won. We resonate with redemption because we know that's how it was supposed to be. But the Bible over and over again deconstructs the idea that the good guys always win. And we're going to look at a few of those places. Genesis 3, you can read it on your own sometime. Genesis 1 and 2, God creates a perfect world. It is beautiful. It is good. Genesis 3, humans choose to sin. They choose to rebel against God, and it shatters that beautiful creation. Th- this, this picture on the screen, you could never put that glass back together if you tried. You could never put it back together to be the seamless, beautiful piece of glass that it once was. This is the reality that we live in. The Bible says the world is under a curse because of sin. That's the old order of things that we're living in right now. Jesus himself says in John 16, he gives both sides of the coin. It's, it's so much truth wrapped up in just a few words. He says, in this world you will have trouble. If anyone ever tells you you won't have trouble in this world or struggle or suffering because you're a Christian, it came right out of Jesus' mouth. You will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Because of Jesus, because he died on the cross to conquer sin, he rose from the dead to conquer death, evil doesn't get the last word. Evil doesn't ultimately win. So the Holocaust doesn't get the last word. Cancer doesn't get the last word. Death doesn't get the last word because of Jesus' victory over sin and death. 
and we look forward to that victory. So here's the thing. The Bible does not support karma. It offers something better. Uh, Karma is uh, what Hindus believe. It's what many Eastern religions believe. And most Christians would say they don't believe karma. Karma is the idea that if you're good, uh, good things will happen to you. And if you're bad, bad things will happen to you. Karma will catch up to you. That karma is going to catch up to you. Christians would say we don't believe that. But what we've done as Christians is, is we've morphed something that I would call Christian karma. And, and Christian karma, it takes basically the same principle of karma, and it attaches God to it like we've been talking about. If you're good, good things will happen to you. And, and, and yeah, and if, for those bad people, bad things should happen to them. Over and over again, the Bible deconstructs this idea of Christian karma. We just looked at Genesis 3. It deconstructed it. We're in a fallen world. John 16, Jesus says, you're going to have trouble in this world. Next, we're going to jump into Psalm 73, and we walk with the psalmist who lived during the Old Testament time, and he is living out the opposite of Christian karma. It, it, is, a, it is an amazingly helpful passage to walk us through these really, really tough questions that I think we face on a daily basis. So this is what the psalmist says. He says, this is what the wicked are like. And the wicked, they're, they're always free of care. They just go on amassing wealth. I mean, they're loaded. They're, so, they're, they're wicked and evil. They're doing all these bad things, but their lives are so great. Surely, in vain, I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in, in innocence all day long. I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. I'm doing the right thing. I'm following God. I mean, this, this, this psalmist is literally writing the Bible. <laughs> but what I receive in return is affliction. What I receive in return is punishment. The psalm goes on. He says, when I try to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. It is deeply troubling. He says, till I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood there, the, the wicked, their final destiny. So surely, God, you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. He's he's trying to get us to to have a picture of how temporary the reign of the wicked is. Can anyone remember what they dreamt about four nights ago? No? But when you're dreaming, I have like the craziest dreams. They they feel so real and so vivid. I often think, this would make a great movie. Like, I need to write this down when I wake up. They feel so real and vivid and and earth-shattering, and I wake up, and I kind of remember them for a a little bit, and then I I stumble around for some coffee and try to get my kids ready for school. By that time, the dream is completely gone, and four days later, totally and completely gone. And he's trying to give us that picture that this is what the reign of the wicked is like. It is so real for a moment, but then it's forgotten like a dream or like a fantasy. The psalm continues, yet I'm always with you. The I is the psalmist there, and you is God. I'm always with you, God. Check this out. He says, in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of my affliction, in the midst of my punishment, you hold me by my right hand, God. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And and earth has nothing I desire but you. Like, are you sure about that? (laughs) Like, you're in the middle of suffering right now and affliction, and he's saying, earth has nothing I desire. How about the end of your suffering? But he's, he's with God, and he's saying, earth has nothing I desire besides you, God. God, I desire you in the midst of my suffering. My flesh and my heart may fail. I might die from this. My body is wasting away, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's powerful stuff. We're going to come back to that. 
the psalm ends like this, those who are far from you, the wicked, they're going to perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God in the midst of my suffering. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all of your deeds. Here's five quick things that I see happening in this psalm. We're going to go through them quick. Number one, the karma formula is garbage. Like the psalmist is living this out. He's like, I'm good, (laughs) and I am suffering. And those people over there are bad, and they are prospering. That is the opposite of Christian karma. That is the opposite of a transactional view of God. Number two, the wicked will be punished eternally. God is going to deal with the wicked. Number three, the bad guy's winning is going to pass like a forgotten dream. Number four, God is with us in our suffering. God is with us in our suffering. God is loving me in the midst of my suffering. He is holding me in the midst of my suffering. Jesus has suffered more on the cross than any human individual ever could suffer in the history of humanity. Jesus is with me in my suffering. Sometimes I think, and we'll get to five in in, in the last piece, but sometimes I think we we learn about theologies of suffering and and theologies of blessing and and good things happening, often from people that, that really aren't suffering all that much. Sometimes in the church world, let's just name it, right? There, 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 there's churches out there where, where the pastor's maybe living in a mansion, and he's telling you, hey, if you give more money, uh, you could be like me. Give more money to my pockets, and God's going to bless you. God's going to make all these really great things happen to you and for you. And you, some of that's maybe bled into to, to how you are relating to God. And, and I wonder what it would be like if we learn more about suffering from people that have suffered like the psalmist if we learn more about suffering from people like slaves in America. If you ever listen to Negro spirituals, some that have been turned in, into our, our hymn books, if you grew up with, at church with hymns like I did, and, and people that, that every day was suffering, and yet God was their refuge and strength. Those are my theologians that I want to go to to learn about the, the, the much smaller amount of suffering that I endure in my life. There's something priceless about learning a theology of suffering, learning where God is in the suffering from people that have suffered, and they have held on to God's hand through that suffering. Number five, our hope is in God's ultimate victory. I think every person that has gone through suffering Every person that has been oppressed, every person that has endured pain has held on to our hope being in God's ultimate victory. That is what got the psalmist through his suffering. That Revelation 21 is coming. It is coming, and we get glimpses of it here. We get little little glimpses of it here and there that Jesus has won the ultimate victory, but there is coming a day when the wicked will no longer prosper, and when death will have no more existence, mourning, crying, and pain will cease to be. The psalm ends with, God is our refuge. Refuge is a place you go when? During a storm or during a war? That's when you go to a refuge. The psalmist never says the storm is going to end and never says the war is going to end. But God is our refuge in the midst of that storm. And I don't want you to lose that. It is not a small thing. But before we get into more of that, we're going to give you some more time at your tables to unpack some of this this very relevant stuff that we're talking about. So the first question, what's an area of your life where you often compare yourself to others? And, and how does that end up leading to unrest and dissatisfaction? So let me read that again. What's an area of your life where you often compare yourself to others? 
Just think about that for a second. How do I compare myself to others? What is it I'm chasing after? And how does that, that comparison game, how does it end up leading to unrest and dissatisfaction? The second question, why do we tend to pull away from God when we go through suffering? So, so I see the Holocaust, I pull away from God. I see, I, I experience suffering myself. I'm, I'm going through this pain and I, so I'm pulling away from God. Why do we do that? And why does the psalmist tell us to draw near to God instead? So six minutes at your tables, and then we'll come back. <laughs> All right, if you can turn your attention back this way. I told you a bit earlier about karma and this idea that the Bible just deconstructs Christian karma over and over again. But I told you the Bible uh, it gives you something better. The Bible doesn't give you karma, it gives you something better. And, and it's this. Um, karma says you get what you deserve. Grace says you get what you don't deserve. Uh, I, I, I don't want what I deserve. <laughs> um, we, we think karma means, oh, you do good things, good things will happen to you. And Grace leads us in a different direction. Check these uh, verses out from Romans 3. This will pop the, the balloon. It'll burst your bubble <laughs> if you have the transactional view of God that, that the good guys are always going to win. Uh, when the, the question, uh, when the good guys lose, like, like there's good guys? What? <laughs> Romans 3 says, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who does good, not even one. Now, now this chapter is leading us towards our need for a Savior. It's leading us towards we can't save ourselves, and, and, and we need to be forgiven. But these passages are so sobering in a great way, in a wake-up call today. I don't want karma. I don't want what I deserve as a sinner. This idea that I could be good enough to measure up to God's standard of holiness. No, I want what I don't deserve, and that's grace. I want to be forgiven. I want the love of God. I want to be held by him. I want to have an intimate relationship with him, which I don't deserve, but he gives it to me freely. I love grace. As we talk through this, I wanted to take a second uh, to, to answer a question maybe you're asking in your head. So, so should we still pray prayer requests? I, I, I don't get it. I, I just kind of thought we prayed prayer requests and, and they happened. And when they don't, we're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know why that one didn't happen. Yes, you should still pray prayer requests. The Bible commands you to pray prayer requests. As God is your refuge and is holding your hand and guiding you through your suffering, he's saying, cast all of your cares upon me because I care for you. I love you. I'm with you. I am holding you. But the difference is this. Your posture changes. Your posture changes. When I say posture, I'm talking the way you carry yourself. Right? When, you, when you carry yourself around your friends in the dorm room, particularly if you're a guy <laughs> like me, you, you kind of carry yourself a little bit like this. Right? You, you already haven't showered in three days, and you're, you know, hopefully you, you know, you're, you're wearing pants. You know, I don't know. Like, right? like you, you got your boxers on. You're playing Madden for like the, I'm on my 80th hour of Madden. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, um, that's your posture. Uh, hopefully, uh, if if you're, uh, <laughs> we'll just go, we'll run with that one. Uh, <laughs> hopefully if, you know, the guys, if, if you know, the, the girl you like uh, walks, walks down the hall, uh, hopefully that's not your posture anymore, right? Ho hopefully you, like, oh, I better go put on some deodorant and, you know, put some pants on and, uh, you know, maybe brush my teeth. And it's like, hey, hey, what's up, baby? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> talking about, I've been like this, yeah. No, I didn't, no I wa that wasn't me playing Madden for 80 hours. No, no, no. <laughs> like our, our posture changes, right, with the people we're around. And, and I think often what happens is we pray to God, just like he's one of the boys, you know. We pray to God uh, even more than that, almost like God is the, is the waiter at the restaurant. Like, hey, God, I ordered this steak medium rare, it's a little too pink, you know what I'm saying? Like, send it back to the, to the chef and fix it for me because this is not what I ordered. I'm paying for this meal, and I want it done right. 
You know what I'm saying? That's how we treat God when we pray often. We have a posture of prayer that it's a bit like this sometimes. We can shake our fists at God and say, you owe this to me, God. And when we pray our prayer requests like that, it's a transactional view of God and it's going to shatter. No, we, we, we pray our requests to God, but it's in a spirit of humility. It's in a spirit of going before God on our knees and just saying, God, I am unworthy. I'm not worthy to even be in your presence, and yet here I am. I'm not worthy to be called your son, and yet you call me your son. I'm not worthy to be in a relationship with you, yet you love me so much. You died for me, and you're with me every single day. You're my father, and I'm your son, and I don't deserve it. And you are holy and almighty God, and I I don't deserve anything, and you've given me grace. God, I'm going through a hard time right now, and I know you love me, and I need you, God. I need you like the psalmist needed you in Psalm 73. God, I'm not asking you to fix everything. I'm asking for more of you. I need more of you because I am struggling right now. I am suffering, and here's what I'm going through. God, can you take this request from me? God, I'm asking you for your mercy, but I'm so thankful that I get you. And I don't deserve you, but I get you. And will you just hold me now? And, and, and you feel far away right now, God, but I know you're not. So will you, just, will you just help me? Will you help me know that you're near? God, thank you for loving me. It's in a very different posture before God. So yes, pray your prayer requests before God, but change the way you pray. Change the way you worship. See, look, if there's anybody in history that should have always won, well, besides Jesus himself. But if the good guys would win because they're good, it would have been the Apostle Paul. See, Paul, he wrote half the New Testament. This guy was so holy. Like, the dude is writing the Bible, okay? He, he has a, a direct line to God. He got to see the risen Christ. If anybody had a, had a, had a line with God where he could say, God, this is going on in my life fix it, change it, it would have been Paul. But let's look at what happened in Paul's life when he was in the midst of suffering. Here's what 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10 says. Paul, he's, he's writing about this prayer exchange with God. He says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. Chew on that for a while, theologians a messenger of Satan, to torment me. I am in torment. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. God, please take the torment away. God, it's, it's Paul. I've, I've been good. Please, God, I am in torment and anguish. Please take it away. God, did you not hear me a third time? Please take the torment away. God does not take the torment away from Paul. But he said to me, he, Jesus speaks to Paul and says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul, I love you. Son or daughter at union tonight, the Father is saying to you, I love you. And look, I made all suffering cease. And right now, you're in the old order of things, and it doesn't make sense. But I made all suffering cease by suffering, Jesus says. I know where you are, and I am with you in it. I am your refuge. And the psalmist said that 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 was better And Paul says, this is better, that Jesus' grace is sufficient. It's a grace that we don't deserve. We're going to have something unique tonight at Union. We're going to have a a fourth song. We're going to worship. 
We're also going to have a prayer invitation for you. We're going to have some people in the back that you can pray with, and I want to give you some, some instructions on this as I, as I close out the teaching tonight. As we worship God in this last song, I want you to worship God for who He is. Don't worship God for, for what he can, he can give you. Don't worship God for what you hope you get from God. But worship God for who he is, the almighty God, the holy of holies. And worship Jesus, the God of suffering, the God who knows suffering, who suffered on the cross so that there would be a day when there's no more suffering. The God who, who made sure that evil doesn't get the last word. Can you imagine if it did? Can you imagine the despair? Now imagine the hope we have in the victory in Jesus that's already been won. That evil does not get the last word. The war's already been won. The tomb is empty. And we're just waiting. And we get to wait with Jesus. And his Holy Spirit, he doesn't leave us alone. Worship that Jesus. The prayer invitation uh, is simple. We have some of our union leaders in the back. If you guys are going to be praying, go ahead and head back there now. And I actually kind of want you to just kind of wave when you all get back there so you guys can see these are not scary people. These are your friends. And this prayer invitation is for anybody. It's, this, this, isn't, this isn't go back there, you know, if you got this going on or that going on. This is just we want to pray with you. We want God to be your refuge. So prayer teams in the back, maybe just, just wave, look at our prayer team. They love to pray with you. They would love to pray with you during this song. They want God to be your refuge and your strength. And I don't know about you, but I can't do it on my own. I'm weak, and I need people to help hold me up. And that's what we're going to do during this song. This song, it's a song uh, that I picked out. It's called Hidden. You, you, you may not have ever heard of it before. You may not be able to jump right in and sing. If you can, I, I'm going to sing it loud because I know it. Uh, but if you can't, it's okay. We want you to reflect on the words. I think this song, it so beautifully walks through Psalm 73 that we are hidden in Jesus and he is walking us through whatever you're going through. He's with you. So, will you please stand with me? And if at any time, go now uh, or during the song, head to the back to just pray with one of our friends who wants to pray with you. And we are going to worship Jesus who made sure that evil does not get the last word. Amen? Amen to that. Let's worship together. Well, I hope that was helpful. I hope it brought even some encouragement during this coronavirus season. I hope it addressed some questions that you have. Also fully acknowledging that when we talk about evil, it is not meant to be here, as I mentioned. And we are never going to fully solve the problem of evil. It is a mystery and it is worth discussing and talking through and taking to the heart of God. And so if you want to talk further about anything that I talked about in this teaching or earlier in the intro of the podcast, please do use the mailbag for that, podcast at beyondthebattle.net. We can talk privately that way, or if you're comfortable, I can share your question and interact with it on the next episode. So hopefully that's an encouragement to you. Thank you for tuning in to the flip side, and I hope it's helpful to you. I hope it's helpful in your walk with the Lord. I hope it helps you break to deeper levels of vulnerability with God and with one another. So if you listen to the flip side, if you're one of those people that's 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 excited about the swag because you want one of the two serious pieces of swag, if you're going, yeah, I want that one with the Bible verse. I want that one with the serious inspirational uh, slogan on it. It's awesome. I mean, I'm so glad you're here. It's great. This You probably want to turn the podcast off right now. You sh I'm warning you right now. I'm telling you, turn it off. If you if you don't, if you're like, no, I'm not going to listen to you. No, I'm going to keep listening. It's your fault. I've warned you. It's your fault. There will not be any singular serious or inspirational or spiritual t uh, content going forward. So you've been truly warned. And uh, if, if, you're, if you're one of those uh, crazy people, if you're one of those unique people, 
unique breeds who's gonna who wants the flip eponymous uh mug that's you i'm in i'm in baby <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is for you. It's time for Noah's rant. Here we go. Noah's rant. All right. So, you know, I like wearing a watch. I like wearing a watch. And it's nice to know what time it is. <laughs> you know, it's nice. It's nice to not have to look at the sun and figure out with a sundial where the shadows lie. It's just nice. I like to know what time it is. Don't you like that? That's super cool. And here's the thing. Watches, are, they make great gifts. You know, you don't. Have, I don't need a Rolex. I'm good. I'm just. A, I'm like a Timex guy. I'm good. I'm, it's good with me. Go to Meijer, Walmart, pick up a Timex. Bam. It's a good gift to give. Gotten gifts of a watch before. I've always been happy with it. Got a watch once. And, uh... I started hearing something. Like, why do I? Why do I hear like a ticking sound all the time? It's like it. It's like it never leaves. It's like it's like I'm trying to sit here quietly and peacefully, just enjoy Jesus and His great creation. And there's like a ticking I can't hear. It's it's almost like I'm going crazy. It's almost like there's like I'm hearing things. It's almost like my blood pressure is getting so high because there's a ticking sound. Somebody they they took this beautiful watch that that my precious wife she she bought from Meyer and 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 she didn't she didn't she didn't know it. She didn't know it had a ticking sound in it cuz at the store they 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 put somebody put a little piece of cardboard in between the little knob so the watch doesn't actually tick. So you can't actually hear the ticking sound until you pay all that money and you get all the way home and you wrap it up like a gift and then you give it to somebody and they open it and they start wearing it and they take the little piece of cardboard out and now tick. Tick. You know what? You know what things tick? Bombs tick. Who wants to walk around their day like Kiefer Sutherland in 24? It's just tick, 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 tick. Raise your hand if you want that. I do not want that. So listen to me, watchmakers. Stop torturing the minds of America and of the world with your incessant ticking of the watch time clock not every watch ticks some of you might say it ticks because it's a clock no i have owned facetime clocks with the the with the the hands on them and the, the little the little numbers not the not the cheater digital kind no the real kind and they don't click and it's beautiful so don't Add the ticking time bomb to my watch. And here's the thing. Some of you, you buy clocks like these. You put them on your walls. You sit there in the sanctuary of your inner sanctum of your home, the place of peace and calm and tranquility. Tick. Tick. And then you invite me to your house. For dinner. Tick. What is wrong with you? Why would you put a torture device on your wall? Tick. Listen to me. I am all about getting a back massage. I hope that's okay with you. It, it causes me no issues. It's, 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 a, it's one of the most relaxing things in the world. My in-laws are great. Every year for my birthday, they just know what to get me. A group on to a back massage. I kid you not, I have been in multiple. I mean, back massages, if you don't get it, what they're supposed to be is the most relaxing place on earth where you all stress goes away. Tick on the wall. I'm not kidding you. Tick. I've been in multiple back massage rooms, massage therapy places, professional, medical, trained, gone to school, got a degree, 
Did you skip that class on not putting a ticking time bomb on your wall while someone's trying to relax in your room and they paid $60 an hour? Tick! Oh. Oh, and I do tell them. I say, please, can you please take the ticking time bomb off the wall for the next hour? Would you still be able to tell the time? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've been meaning to take that down. Oh, yeah. Just, I'm so, I'm, I just keep forgetting. I'm so sorry. Oh, you forget? It takes every second to remind you. How could you possibly forget? Tick. So, we didn't know his rant. We want the world to be a better place, and we've done that today because I know that the makers of clocks and watches listen. I know I get, I get a lot of fan mail from them. I know they listen, and so so they've heard the message. They're going to stop making the clocks and the watches that tick and just let us have peace. Let us have quiet. Our, our, our anxiety levels will go way down. Our, our quality of life will go way up. You are welcome, world. You are welcome for Noah's rant, making your world a better place. Aren't you glad for Noah's rant? Aren't you glad for the Flipside podcast? I mean, where would we be as a society if it weren't for Noah's rant? <laughs> Thank you for listening today. This wraps up episode 29. Woo! Episode 3 of the quarantine. If you have not subscribed, please do so. Would you leave a review on iTunes? That sure would be fantabulous. Stay tuned next time for updates on the swag. You know it. Until next time, see you on the flip side. The Flip Side with Noah Filipiak is a South Francis Press production. Copyright Noah Filipiak. www.noahfilipiak.com. Theme music by Kyle Lake at K Lake Music. Use with permission. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or wherever podcasts are found. Yow, yow, dripping in that gall that don't perish. People selling fake, see the green around their belly. Taking refuge in his hand, see his poems, my living quarters. Close them when I'm finished, it's time to bring me closer. There's no purgatory, cause you in or you out. When you see him in the clouds, then you know it's going down. Raise them, raise them, raise them. They've been sleeping for some ages. Now all God's babies so confused by this hatred. Poor pit preachers shouldn't aim to be A-list. Money probably long, but short is with your days. Have you ever heard the sound of freedom? Then I hope you see him clearly. Raise him, raise him, raise him. They've been sleeping for some ages. Now all God's babies so confused by this hatred. Poor pit preachers shouldn't aim to be A-list. Money probably long, but 